thank you guys to everybody who could join us today. And if you couldn't, but RSVP, you'll get a full uh, recording of today's video in your inbox, um, as well as everybody who's here today as well. Um, so first off, my name is Teal. I work at the NYU Tandon School of Engineering's Data Future Labs. Um, the Data Future Lab is a nonprofit operating in New York City for over 10 years uh, with a specific mandate of creating more tech jobs in both New York City and New York State. A few companies that have come through our program include CB Insights, Bouncex, uh, Vettery, Seven Park, Paper Space, um, Carmera, Prion, and a few others. Um, so anyway, we've got an incredibly important uh, conversation today focused on the private sector's response to the growing challenges of disinformation and the potential opportunities for both investors and entrepreneurs. So without further delay, I'd love to introduce you to uh, our speaker, Craig Silverman. Craig is an award-winning journalist, author, and technologist who is currently a media editor at BuzzFeed News. Um, so Craig is, uh, has probably been on the disinformation beat for longer than anyone else I know of uh, in the journalism space. He's attributed with um, helping to bring the problem of disinformation into the wider public discourse. During the 2016 election, um, he uncovered a massive network of viral Macedonian troll farms that were pumping out political propaganda, uh, mostly in support of Donald Trump. And those farms continue to be highly active today. He's currently covering Facebook and other social media companies, uh, mostly inadequate efforts to curb the spread of dis disinformation on their platforms. And from a Future Labs perspective, we're especially excited to have Craig with us because he's also a technology entrepreneur. In 2004, uh, he founded a blog called Regret the Error, which um, covered fact checking and media inaccuracy. And uh, in 2014, he founded a tech company called Emergent that uh, used data to both identify and debunk online hoaxes in real time. So Craig, welcome and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Teal. Hi, everyone. Um, it's it's actually, as, as Teal kind of said, I feel sometimes like an, an old man of the disinformation beat. And so the idea that there's actually an event where there are multiple companies in the, you know, what is now a disinformation uh, detection and remediation space is is incredible to me. Uh, and I mean, on the one hand, it speaks to some of the huge challenges that we have in front of us as people and societies uh, and countries in a global community. Uh, on the other, it's great to see that there are entrepreneurs and people stepping up uh, and seeing opportunity to develop products to offer services in this area. And so, uh, you know, I, I want to talk a little bit um, about, you know, from my perspective, just sort of like where I see some of the opportunities and also challenges uh, in, in the market for delivering uh, services and products around disinformation, some of the, um, you know, some of the approaches that we're seeing right now. But I do want to also kind of go back in time a little bit. And, uh, and Teal mentioned to you that uh, back in 2014, I had a project called Emergent. Um, and I'm just going to share my screen here. Uh, and if it doesn't work, somebody let me know. Uh, but you know, for me, uh, where we are today versus where we were, you know, when I started the project about six and a half years ago, it's just incredible for me to think about. And there are some things that kind of remain as lines through from then to today. And there are some things that are really remarkably different. So, so let's go back in time to 2014 when almost nobody cared about <laughs> this issue and these problems and where there was basically little or zero funding available, certainly on the VC side, uh, not much interest in there uh, at all. And in terms of nonprofit and other kinds of grants, not a huge amount of, of interest and, uh, and motivation there. And in terms of people in journalism and people in the information security community and researchers, it was a relatively small group of nerds. Uh, and, and I'm proud to say, I guess I was one of those nerds. And so I wanted to share with you as I was going back and thinking about this uh, this event, uh, I, I went to see, I was sure I had built a deck and lo and behold, I had actually built a deck for Emergent. And so I just want to show you some of the pieces of it, of this kind of snapshot back in history of the stuff that I, sort of I was thinking about then um, and what might actually be products in this area then, some of which which rings true today, some of which, do, which doesn't. And I want to emphasize this is not me, one, trying to raise money again. I'm not. And two, this is also not me showing that I had built a brilliant deck down and nobody you know, wanted to, to fund it or anything like that. Um, I think there's a lot of flaws in the deck, but going back in time, I think is a really interesting exercise before we fast forward to a very different moment now. 
So here's what Emergent was. It was a website where on the front facing part of it, we would identify claims, uh, myself, a research assistant, would identify claims, things that were spreading on Twitter, on Facebook, um, or that had been reported uh, on, by news websites. And then we would create kind of a claim page around them of what the claim is. Um, you can see there in the bottom right corner, the tract, there's you know, different numbers, some with green next to it. Those are uh, articles or claims out there that had said, well, this claim is true. Then the red ones were ones that had said it was false. And those with this sort of you know, blank white zero white space in them were ones that sort of just simply said, this claim exists. We don't know whether it's true or false. And the goal for us was to try and gather information over time to determine whether they were true or false as a service to the public, but also to gather the data about the social engagement around it to get a sense of when it was true, when it was false, when it was first circulated, what were the trends? And in the cases where something was false, when it was debunked, did the amount of social engagement on Twitter and on Facebook actually come close to meeting the amount for the articles that maybe falsely claimed that it had been true? Uh, and so, you know, the pitch at the time was, it answers a key question of the networked age, is it true? Uh, and, you know, another thing that you would see on the claims page, again, is that social data over time. And in this case, we have a claim, um, uh, a hoax article, which was confirmed false on October 14th. But in the days after that, there were plenty of other uh, reports and websites that claimed that it was true, getting those green bars of engagement. And then the debunkings got a very small amount. And this is a dynamic we see playing out today, which I think creates some of the market opportunity. How do we get the truth to spread as quickly and as broadly as falsehoods, as rumors? Um, how can we actually stop those false claims as early as possible so they don't get wide distribution? Still really big challenges that we have today. Uh, and in terms of you know, the pitch, I sort of talked about how, uh, you know, rumors, hopes, misinformation on Earth claims spread rapidly in our environment. They move market, create confusion and chaos, distort events. So these are, these are the problems um, that I was trying to solve then. Probably still true today, right? Although we could probably um, find many more examples of real world harm, of real world financial repercussions and damage than I was able to marshal back in 2014. Uh, and one of the things that was interesting to me in looking back at this was uh, was the World Economic Forum, the members of the World Economic Forum, actually back in a survey in 2014, had identified the rapid spread of mis misinformation online as one of the top 10 uh, trends and, and sort of, you know, a threat that was of global significance. Um, it sort of just made the top 10, but it was interesting that I think they were a little bit ahead of their time because, again, it was not in the normal conversation of everyday life like this issue is today. Uh, and, you know, I, I was at the time I mentioned how we could find probably better examples today. Well, you know, there were headlines of, you know, very clear economic um, and financial repercussions and other kinds of repercussions from false um, and, and incorrect information. And the idea was to try and attack that uh, and find ways of, of building value in being able to determine what was true and what wasn't. Um, you know, the, the pitch was that we were building the world's largest data set of rumors and online media's coverage of them. And the, the thing that we were going to try and do was over time was to gather um, a big data set about claims. Some were true, some were false, the media coverage of them, and to maybe get to the point where very early on when something circulated because of our historical data, because of our corpus of data, maybe we could actually make a good prediction about whether something would be true or false based on past historical patterns or knowing that a certain reporter at a certain website tends to get <laughs> certain types of stories right or wrong. And that was the idea was that data would accrue a lot of value over time. Uh, and one of the examples that we did with this was we partnered with Fast Company Magazine and we, we collected all of the Apple rumors ahead of a big event in March of 2015. And then we decided who got them right and who got them wrong. And over time, we probably could have figured out who was really reliable about Apple Watch data and really bad with, you know, uh, Macintosh, uh, Mac data, but, you know, really good with uh, iPhone data and, you know, figuring out where the good predictions were. So... Just to quickly wrap that up, you know, this is, I think, one of the most relevant things from it is, you know, the pitch at the time was that these were the ways that I thought Emergent could make money. One was, you know, data or API products where we'd have that large corpus of data. It would have intelligence in it about, you know, rumors and claims and true and false, and it would be able to be used, you know, to be integrated into other products, um, thinking about RSS readers 
you know, Google News, financial terminals, media databases was the idea. And, you know, when we look at a lot of the companies in the disinformation space right now, there are a lot in this kind of area. Um, advertising on the website, offering a premium uh, offering like a browser plugin to give people ratings on specific articles or websites, which again, you know, we're going to see from some of the players today uh, are offering things like that. Um, and then also, you know, is there a way to kind of white label our platform or partner with news organizations and earn revenue that way? And so that's what I was thinking back in 2014. And, I, and while I did get some small amounts of seed, uh, you know, raised, because I, I initially funded the development myself and then got a research fellowship at Columbia University to, to pay for my time, I did secure some seed, but ended up deciding instead to join BuzzFeed News uh, in, uh, in spring of 2015 and Emergent has kind of been dormant ever since then. And so as we get into 2015 and 2016, you know, one of the things that I want to emphasize is, you know, there has been a disinformation business and it's been going on for, for many years now. And it predates, I think all of the, the companies that you're going to hear from today, it predates investor interest. The problem has been that the market for disinformation has been on the bad side. It has been in the creation and dissemination of disinformation. There has been a real economic opportunity for people, especially in the developing part of the world, in order to create and spread false and misleading information and earn money from that thanks to programmatic advertising. And, you know, Teal mentioned off the top the story that I did with Lawrence Alexander. This was published a week before Election Day in 2016 about young men and teens um, in North Macedonia who were running websites um, that were focused on American politics, that were spreading a lot of false and misleading and, and conspiratorial stories and doing amazing engagement on Facebook and therefore getting lots of traffic to their websites. And I, I mean, in a, in a country like North Macedonia, these, these young men and teens were earning more money in a month than their parents might earn in a year or several years. It was a massive influx of wealth into, in particular, a one small town there, Vela's. And this has been the case, and it's still dynamic today, where people in the developing world who have good digital skills can, you, can use them for social media manipulation or disinformation or other kinds of things like that and actually earn money a lot easier than doing some more legitimate things. And this is one of the reasons why we have a problem, but it's also really about economics, and it's something to think about in this market. Uh, here's some concrete numbers of what, what this kind of looks like. So this is a spreadsheet that was leaked to me and I've actually never published this before, um, so I'm giving an exclusive here. Uh, this is uh, a spreadsheet of, of income for uh, 2015 for a, net, a network of about two or three hyperpartisan American websites. Um, these guys own some on the conservative side. They also ended up launching some on the liberal side. It wasn't about politics. It was really just about money. And they spread a lot of false stories. So most of it was just hyperpartisan, really torqued headlines and that kind of thing, appealing to political views. But they also would spread a lot of false claims. Uh, and so this was, in a sense, a disinformation operation. And you know, the long and the short of it here is like this is 12 months of of you know revenue and expenses, you know their total income for 2015 was 2.5 million dollars. This was from a variety of advertising, you know uh, whether it was Google AdSense or Taboola or what have you, and their expenses. It was just a couple guys with a few freelance writers. Their expenses for the year were under 600 thousand dollars. So their net, you know, the net was 1.9 million dollars. That's a pretty small, efficient operation clearing a huge amount of profit. Anybody would be happy with that kind of margin, although, you know, a relatively small amounts compared to others. But this is what's been going on. The, the money has been made on the other side, and that's been the case. Um, and so it's wonderful that here we are now in 2020, and we see, you know, headlines like these where, you know, James Murdoch, I guess the, you know, the, the, the more left-leaning member of the Murdoch clan has decided to in, make investments in companies trying to combat fake news. Um, Betaworks is one of the, you know, the VC firm slash accelerators that, uh, that he partnered with, and they are putting a lot of money and a lot of effort into funding companies around fixing the internet. And on, some of those companies have been in this area of kind of detection and defense um, and, and helping is particularly around synthetic media, um, images and video and that kind of thing. And lo and behold, here we are in 2020. And I know this is not all the companies in this space, but these are the ones that off the top of my head that I, you know, I could think of existed because I get, I get lots of emails from them. And it's amazing to me where, you know, in 2014, 
where basically, you know, and when I was going around with Emergent, I mean, there weren't really any other offerings like that. There, of course, were fact-checking organizations, but far fewer than today. But here we are today, and this is like a tiny, small sample, I think, of the companies that are playing in this area. And some of them are represented today in this event. And it's really, again, incredible to me to think that we have come to this point where there is an emerging industry where there'll probably be, if there hasn't already been a loom escape for the disinformation uh, industry. And we have so many different ones playing in different areas. Um, and I think that's one of the things that I want to dive into a little bit of just, you know, again, this is just my perspective of what I kind of see emerging uh, in this area. Um, so one, when we think about the challenges and opportunities, the problem has gotten worse, which I guess if you're building a company in this area, I mean, that's, you know, that's creating a market for you, right? Um, and that's, that's what we've seen is there's been an awakening since 2016, the US election, Brexit, um, the national elections in the Philippines, where people are realizing that, you know, the scale of this problem is massive, it is global, it is interconnected. Uh, and, and so the problem in those ensuing four years or so, I don't think, you know, a lot of stuff has improved, but there are still huge problems and challenges. So uh, in a sense, a good thing if you're trying to, to help combat that and build a company in the area. We still have a very complicated and chaotic information environment. It's at a scale unheard of in human history, and it's gonna take some real talent and ingenuity, human talent, you know, AI and other things to figure out how we actually get our arms around this kind of a problem. Uh, you know, I think a big piece here is, if you're thinking about a company in this space, you of course, and you wanna get funding, you of course have to think about what kind of an exit might be possible. And the fact that platforms are under so much pressure and so much scrutiny and are trying to get, get their arms around this problem, and also wildly profitable, you know, of course, uh, an acquirer, uh, a platform as an acquirer is something that exists today um, that a few years ago, they probably didn't feel such a, uh, such a sense of urgency to actually look at companies in this area. And so that's an opportunity there that wasn't there before. Uh, and I think that we, we would all agree that there, you know, disinformation, trolling, rumors, other types of coordinated online campaigns and fakery can absolutely have real economic financial ramifications. They can uh, damage brand or personal reputation. They can take a stock price and drive it into the floor or, or increase it uh, due to you know, inaccurate information. Um, they could hurt your sales and overall revenue. And so you know, I'm sure the companies that are talking today you know, target the private sector in many cases. Uh, and this is the kind of thing that, that companies are having to face now that they weren't thinking about just a few years ago. I think it's great that you know, venture capital firms and other types of funders are recognizing that there is a problem in this area, but also that they think there's opportunity. That's a key thing uh, to have funders interested in funding it, educating themselves about the space. There have been um, you know, foundations like the Knight Foundation and others who have been interested in helping fund you know, anti-disinformation efforts and other kinds of things. But I do think that having not just the nonprofit sector interested in this and having, you know, for-profit VCs looking at opportunities is a great way to really grow the opportunity and a great way to also come up with new solutions because that's a very motivating factor. The other thing that I'll just flag is one of the things I've noticed is that information security companies, traditional kind of infosec companies, threat intelligence companies, have sort of tried to expand their offerings to capture the disinformation space as well. And I think when we talk about the competitive landscape, there are kind of pure play, anti-disinformation or you know, improving the news ecosystem plays out there. But there are also the, the existing massive infosec industry who are saying, oh, you know, this fits in what we do. Why don't you just continue to work with us and pay us more? And I think that's, you know, that's a challenge for some of the pure plays, although it also represents a potential acquirer. Um, so to, to just wrap up, you know, I've seen a few general buckets that I think a lot of the companies and offerings have fallen into. Um, you know, some of the more people and services and sort of manual oriented are doing disinformation, detection, defense, investigations. Some of those are like nonprofits or think tanks that are in some cases working with Facebook or others. Um, you know, s similar things for, you know, people who are trying to uh, identify media manipulation like deep fakes or other types of visual manipulation. Uh, they have some manual work, but they're trying to develop their own proprietary technology for doing that. And that also applies to people who are helping with the massive scale problem around content moderation, which I think touches on this area 
a little bit, you know, can you, can you build those, you know, those classifiers, can you build AI to really deal with this problem at scale and deal with a very high level of accuracy? That again is something that in particular platforms are interested in building their own products, but if you can do it better, that's certainly gonna get their attention. Um, we're seeing offerings like, you know, NewsGuard where uh, they're building data and trying to integrate that in web browsers, but they're also building, you know, the browser plugins for front-facing people. Um, the, as I mentioned, there's, you know, think tanks and other companies that have partnerships with Facebook and others. And, you know, TikTok needs to be making partnerships. Snapchat is making partnerships. So I think the more platforms we have, the more opportunities there are for that. And as I mentioned, you know, the synthetic, uh, area of media, deep fakes, and visual manipulation. Uh, that has been an area where I think a lot of startups rushed in. And now they're realizing that, you know, they may not be a widespread enough threat that being a deep fake detection technology is enough on its own. So a lot of them have kind of broadened their scope uh, out from that a little bit. And then, you know, the last broad kind of bucket I see are, uh, you know, approaches to try and build and improve our information ecosystem and create new business models and new products for sustainable news. Uh, not exactly in the disinformation space, more about improving the overall information ecosystem. And if we have both of those things going on, you know, trying to detect and get rid of the bad stuff, but also elevating good quality news, um, then that's going to have a really remarkable effect. And, you know, just, just to end on one thing that kind of harkens back to, to this deck I did back in 2014, 2015, I think this slide is still true that there is real opportunity in this area far more now than there was in 2014 and 2015 for all the reasons I've mentioned. And I think what Richard Gingras uh, from, from Google had said then is, is true today, which is that in today's burgeoning and chaotic news ecosystem, it's still difficult to parse truth from falsehood, wisdom from spin, and it is absolutely time to consider new approaches. And so that's why it's exciting to see an event like this and exciting to see the companies that are presenting at this and the entrepreneurs and technologists and other people who have decided to take on this really difficult, really important major problem um, and try to advance it. So uh, with that, I'm looking forward to the rest of the program and uh, thank you very much for having me. Awesome. Thank you so much, Craig. I just wanted to follow up with like, we've got a, a few uh, questions in the chat and maybe like one or two. Great. Um, so one person um, or maybe a few of them are uh, interested in the, you know, misinformation versus disinformation. They both get thrown a lot around a lot. Um, what is the difference and, uh, you know, is there a different approach to either of them or is it the same uh, tools? Yeah, um, you know, the, the terminology piece of this world has, uh, has become difficult in some ways because the term fake news has really been weaponized. Uh, and that was a term I started using when I was doing that research project to describe a specific thing. But I do think that um, misinformation and disinformation are, you know, good ones to use. So disinformation is really more about consciously created, you know, intentionally created false content or information spread deliberately created to, you know, to deceive people. Misinformation is a case where, you know, you have well-meaning people who don't realize what they're passing along is false or misleading and they help propagate it. Uh, and so, you know, I think there's a piece there which is about the intent, which disinformation is created with the intent to, to trick, to deceive, potentially to harm. And misinformation is really more about people who unintentionally, for whatever reason, are kind of passing along things that are false or misleading. And, and, and I think it is useful to have that distinction in, in this conversation in particular, because you know, a lot of the, the startups are oftentimes trying to figure out where something originated and you know the origins of it and and all, often it will originate as a consciously created piece of disinformation but the way it propagates is through misinformation where well-meaning people who are maybe just you know it aligns with their existing beliefs are passing it along um and i think another question uh that was interesting was you know once sort of the genie's out of the bottle and disinformation misinformation have kind of uh, infected enough people, um, it's really hard to bring or change people's minds um, after that. Um, do you think there are different tools or approaches needed for uh, that effort? Um, or have, has, have you seen anything where, um, you know, what's the best way to, I guess, 
uh, this is this is poor choice of words, but like correct uh, mistaken beliefs. Yeah, um, you know that that piece of kind of changing someone's mind or or their views is is a really difficult one, and a lot of times that's where people start talking about fact checking. Well, you know, if you fact check it. Hopefully people read the fact check and they realize it's wrong. But when someone gets a piece of information, there, there's kind of the conscious level of it, of us reading it and thinking about it. And then there's a lot that is happening, um, you know, on an unconscious or subconscious level. And if something aligns with our existing beliefs or things we want to believe, we are far more inclined to accept that information. And a simple fact check isn't necessarily going to knock that out, um, you know, nor is a label by a platform. And so... Uh, so that is a really persistent kind of problem, and it takes a longer term approach and a longer term solution. But w one of the things that would help, obviously, is if, you know, people were not encountering the falsehood in the first place, if we were better at detecting and reducing the spread and reducing the harm in the first place, which is where, you know, there's a lot of opportunity for doing that. And then when it comes to, you know, the sort of human interaction with it, that, I think there's a huge opportunity for education there where we are in a very different kind of information environment than we were even 10 years ago. I think a lot of us are struggling with it, some more than others, and, and figuring out how we can help equip people better to navigate this information ecosystem is gonna be really beneficial and is gonna help a lot, um, but it is a long-term process. And it is also not just about people who are school age, but everyone at every age. And so it's kind of a whole of society challenge and problem we need to think about. All right, everyone. Um, Craig Silverman, thank you for joining us. Um, we're going to showcase um, a few uh, startups, uh, technology-backed startups in this space, um, and kind of like see how they're approaching the disinformation uh, problem from the market side. So first up, I'd love to introduce you to Robert Matney, who's a, the Managing Director of Government Affairs at Yonder AI. Uh, Robert's going to be telling you about their VC-backed technology effort to curb disinformation for both governments and brands. Um, so Rob has been involved in emerging technologies since 2000. Um, he's founded several technology and arts companies himself. Um, he's also the author of a uh, 2018 Senate Intelligence Committee disinformation report on Russian interference in the 2016 U.S. election. Um, he's a misinformation expert on both how mis and disinformation spreads and how it, uh, how it affects brands, both directly and indirectly. Uh, Robert, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, Teal. I appreciate it. Uh, are you able to hear and see me okay? Yes, doing great. Fantastic, good. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. So uh, I guess I just want to start real quick with uh, gratitude to the NYU School of Engineering's Future Labs for hosting this conversation on the business of disinformation and how uh, commercial technology can help meet the challenge at this moment. Um, so today, uh, I want to set some high level framing for our work, a little about our company bio and how we view one role that technology can play in addressing disinformation. Um, so my name is Robert Matney. I'm the Managing Director of Government Affairs at Yonder uh, and am a disinformation and internet influence analyst. Uh, and you can find me on Twitter there. Um, so Yonder's on a mission to build a more authentic internet by revealing the patterns of how, where, and why narratives spread online. But of course, uh, the question is, how, how did the company get here? So our co-founders came out of work in national security, which included evaluating the ways that ISIS was leveraging its uh, online caliphate to radicalize and recruit, and crucially, how they made themselves appear much more numerous and influential than they, in fact, were. Uh, they then hypothesized at the time that a well-funded entity could leverage these same vulnerabilities in online platforms and our information ecosystem to wield extremely outsized or disproportionate impact on public discourse. And we then saw that in action when we were commissioned by the Senate Intelligence Committee to provide the authoritative analysis on Russian influence operations targeting the U.S. 2016 election. And of course, we promptly saw the ways in which commercial entities and public discourse about brands was getting tied up in the same kinds of mechanics. And so we built out a SaaS offering 
to bring visibility and actionable intelligence to these patterns in online discourse. So a, a few company stats about uh, where we are in our trajectory as a company. Um, the company was launched in 2017. We are a VC backed uh, company. We have raised about 18 million to date. And those investment rounds were led by GGV, Lux and Moonshots Capital. And we support the public sector and we also support some leading brands. And some of those brands include Home Depot, Disney, Johnson & Johnson, and Bumble. Uh, and our clients are generally under annual contract agreements. Uh, and speaking to something that Craig said earlier, it is a fascinating moment to really watch uh, this emerging space uh, to see how technology companies are coming out of the woodwork in order to solve different corners of this problem. So let's turn our focus to the problem. Um, you know, some I think would say that the internet is a dumpster fire and I myself vary on this point, kind of depending on the hour, I suppose. But I do definitely think that we are in a, a global epistemic crisis that heavily impacts our ability to solve other big problems we face like climate change and other uh, magnificently important problems. I expect that we can all agree on this call at least that the internet doesn't work in the same way that it did initially. And it certainly isn't the democratizing and emancipatory tool that many of us, including myself, had hoped for. I think those things are still there in action and potential. They're, they're part of the landscape, but the landscape is also riddled with opportunity to deceive and misrepresent. And the patterns of how and why those things spread uh, aren't highly opaque. These vulnerabilities affect all of us. So when we say the internet's not what it used to be, this is what we mean. Most existing tools were built for the old internet where things could be reasonably taken at face value. We built Yonder to solve for the data gaps that are left by some of those other tools uh, in their effort to serve big brands and organizations. Um, and our hope is that we can provide value to organizations and, and brands that are vulnerable to online manipulation. So for example, brands spend millions of dollars on demographically targeted campaigns, but in a way, at least, they're missing the boat online. Demographics don't really reflect how today's online cultures express their identities and their beliefs online. Factions that factions of users that center around common passions and ideologies are really now today's power groups. And these factions of hyperactive accounts with shared agendas work in concert to frame and influence narratives and perceptions. Sometimes factions are benign, they're grassroots articulations of shared passion and advocacy, and, and as such should be celebrated. But sometimes, of course, they're also fabricated and highly inauthentic. Virality used to be a reasonable barometer for the level of interest, engagement, and consensus that hovered around a topic. But that assumption, at least the assumption that that remains true, ignores the fact that a large number of viral conversations are artificially engineered through various tactics. Brands and organizations simply cannot take posts online at face value. The posts are not created equal. Some posts carry more weight and influence than others. And it's not enough to track post volume unless you are also looking at the bigger picture. So factions are great at making stories go viral and shaping news headlines. And there are a host of tactics that are used to spread disinformation. Uh, and here's a set of them. Sure, of course, there's bots, but there's also sock puppet accounts operated by people, but under false pretenses and with an agenda. There's hashtag hijacking, fake coupon campaigns, which are surprisingly prevalent, uh, coordinated boycotts and review bombing, the list goes on and on. Uh, and, and there are important distinctions around terms like disinfo, misinfo, fake news. F for the moment, uh, let's just lump them together to a degree and say that it isn't a matter of what's factual or fabricated. It's for us at least about how groups make those things spread and by whom they are spread. 
because social listening tools were built to understand when something is trending, they are often insufficient to identify how the thing was made to trend in the first place. And not coincidentally, the tools themselves and therefore decisions made based on them and their intelligence are subject to the very same coordinated tactics and influence mechanics that factions deploy to frame and manipulate discussion in the first place. So at Yonder, we leverage a broad collection of publicly available social platform data, as well as massive behavior and narrative similarity clustering. In doing so, we seek to bring transparency to the full narrative trajectory. We label at scale groups of accounts that behave in highly similar ways and automatically analyze how those groups then move through conversations. We identify leading indicators of emerging narratives, such as whether or not they are originated or amplified by high risk factions. So a high risk faction, for example, might be uh, the passionate QAnon faction, or it might be a, a network of accounts known to be state sponsored. Um, and then we also track topics from the more fringe platforms. So those more fringe platforms include things like 8chan, which currently resides at the domain 8kun, and, and other platforms. And the reason why noting what's going on on those platforms is important is because not infrequently, those are the platforms where tactics are conscientiously workshopped and tested before a coordinated attempt to influence discourse is launched onto the more mainstream platforms. And then, of course, after an incident, after a topic has burst out, we also supply analytics that help contextualize what occurred and the risk of recurrence of that narrative. Spoiler alert, the narratives almost always recur over time. Thinking into the business ecosystem in which we operate, Yonder sits adjacent to social listening and digital risk companies, combining the resilient data pipeline, data analytics, and the SaaS availability strengths of social listening with the coordinated effort detection of cybersecurity companies to bring a more complete picture. And in the fight against disinformation, there are, of course, a number of roles to play, including things like media literacy education or fact checking, which I think is well represented later in this session by Factmata, policy adjustments, et cetera. But yonder, our focus is different. Our goal is to shine a light on the patterns that indicate when a small group is influencing discussion in a way that is disproportionate with the human participants and provide leading indicators, real-time tracking, and after analysis. So just to bring things to a concrete case study, the actress starring in the live action Mulan uh, movie tweeted in support of the Hong Kong police. And this, of course, was unexpected by the brand, by Disney, but it is not the first or last time a brand spokesperson or persona makes comments regarding political or social issues uh, for this brand, and, and then the brand has to issue a response. In this case, the incident was linked to inauthentic activity online, meaning that some considerable proportion of the accounts that were involved were bots and sock puppet accounts amplifying messages using the, the boycott Mulan hashtag until, sure enough, real Twitter accounts, including some of the blue checkmark accounts, like the one that you can see here on the slide, started using that hashtag as well. Months later, the brand is still monitoring the hashtag as well as factions online in order to anticipate fact, uh, future attacks that leverage the brand's massive platform in order to spread political or social agendas. So bringing it to a close, uh, Yonder still believes in the promise of the internet and the positive power of a disintermediated marketplace of ideas. And we believe that by shining a light on the patterns of information spread, both in terms of narrative analysis, language analysis, as well as network attribution, 
and including patterns of coordination and manipulation, we believe that brands, organizations, and the broader public can make the smartest assessments that right-size the interpretation, the preparation, and the response to that information. And we believe that this transparency is fully commensurate with the celebration of human-scaled free speech. And that brings me to a close. I'm really happy to have been a part of this. Thank you for including me. That's awesome, Robert. Um, if you have just a moment, uh, we wanted to take one question. Uh, we're trying to move through uh, this really quickly because we only have 90 minutes. Um, but an interesting one, is there a universal standard um, or credential for fact checking uh, or combating disinformation? So uh, this person is asking from the framework that um, you know, Facebook and Twitter have been labeling uh, information and then you know, being called to testify today um, about how they're labeling misinformation. But a lot of, uh, uh, I guess, people in the government are even, uh, and the greater public, labeling them anti-GOP or biased. Um, is there any kind of standard across the industry? Uh, does there need to be? How do we get there? Well, I, there is not, at least not to my knowledge. And, and I don't know of, of one that's even at a mature level of evolution and development. And yes, I do think that that will be highly uh, valuable. We don't, in fact, focus on veracity or truth value. We're really looking exclusively at how that information is spread by tightly coordinated or highly similar groups of people. And I, I do think there's a beautiful future where that is labeled too, right? Where, where you can say, for example, there was this marvelous post, I think yesterday, uh, Friday, about, it, it was fantastically funny on TikTok about um, brigading a hashtag that was around some hypothetically violent protests, saying, on the platforms, hey, this hashtag has been recently highly populated by a massive number of new participants. Uh, I think would be a valuable, a valuable way of labeling that information. And then when the inevitable happens in the original participants in that hashtag, they pay to another hashtag so that they can sustain their conversation. Labeling that one too, this is a newly created hashtag that's been rapidly populated. That's the kind of uh, transparency and visibility that I think would be really useful for the platforms to develop over time. And certainly they're the kind of patterns that we're looking at interpreting automatically and at scale. That's wonderful. I think that's a great start. Um, for everyone who's interested in learning more about Yonder AI, please visit their website. Um, obviously follow Robert Matney um, or look him up online. I'm sure he'd be happy to take uh, any more of your questions. Robert, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm going to move straight on to our next uh, startup presenter. Um, we're really excited to have her with us today. Uh, it's fascinating, fast-growing startup um, in disinformation mitigation, Aletheia Group, uh, founded by Lisa Kaplan. So Lisa uh, founded Aletheia Group to help organizations navigate the new digital reality um, and protect themselves against disinformation. Um, she's been the digital director for uh, Senator Agnes King's re-election campaign in 2018. Um, she designed and executed, uh, you know, defensive digital strategies to both identify and understand, as well as respond to disinformation attacks. Um, and so she's got first-hand experience on the campaign trail. Uh, and prior to all this, she was a consultant at PricewaterhouseCoopers um, and uh, the U.S. Department of State. So um, she's got a lot of uh, perspective, I think, from the U.S. government and how uh, government bodies are dealing with misinformation. Lisa, welcome, and thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. Excited to be here. Um, and so um, with that introduction, I'll talk a little bit. I know that this is also a discussion to talk about the business solutions related to disinformation. So I'm happy to dive into that as well. But um, just a little bit about our approach to this challenge. So. When we think about disinformation, we're really thinking about and talking about the impacts of disinformation. And then we like to think about how we can potentially reverse engineer what's happening to identify all of the different points that um, a company or an organization or an individual could then go and take action. Um, and what the action that an individual or a company or an organization will wanna take is unique to them because they have their own unique goals, their own unique digital footprint, 
and um, they also have their own unique risk tolerances. And so everything we do is very highly tailored to each client. So we first start by um, detecting what's actually happening out there on the internet. And to do that, we use a variety of different uh, methodologies. We've built our own proprietary technologies that have made us better, stronger, and faster in order to be able to um, not only understand what's happening, but getting at some of what Robert was speaking about. We're able to understand what's real and what's not real, but then we're also able to understand what can you do about it? Because for a company that's facing something like a falling stock price or a candidate that is at risk of losing voters, um, situational awareness just isn't enough anymore. So that's how we start our investigations. And then we try to understand what's the impact of disinformation. This has been a hotly debated topic in the countering disinformation community as to whether or not you can measure influence and impact. We believe that you can, um, and we do believe that disinformation does have an impact. So for example, when we talk about the 2020 elections, a lot of the work that we did um, as part of our public interest work was to detect and mitigate instances of disinformation in real time. And so when we looked at what was happening on election day, it was primarily concentrated in key swing states. It didn't look like it was anything that seemed um, super nefarious in the sense that it didn't look like it was starting from a state actor, but they were high impact narratives that potentially could mislead voters. So for example, on Pennsylvania, we saw on election day in Pennsylvania, we saw allegations of um, ballots being thrown out. We saw allegations later of, um, you know, 100,000 or so votes being uploaded into a system that were all for one candidate. And these isolated incidents add up. And what we saw was um, the, the velocity at which these narratives and these pieces of content were shared and then posted organically by others seemed to show that they were catching on. Fast forward, we now have a number of lawsuits that are completely baseless being filed, further adding legitimacy. We saw people in positions of trust to certain communities, um, such as um, political pundits or online influencers who are then also sharing these narratives. And what it does is it creates um, an alternate algorithmic silo set of realities so that the people who are being exposed to those narratives and trust those individuals and are hearing the repetition of these false allegations, all of the sudden are really starting to believe that there was widespread voter fraud, when in fact we have no evidence of that. And so um, what that means is when we then take a look at some of the offline indicators, and actually Politico did a poll, now 70% of Republicans believe that this election may not be legitimate because of widespread voter fraud. That all started with a false narrative. Um, and so when we think about disinformation and its impacts, what we do is we look at the information flows. We attribute to the extent possible and attribution is hard. And I'm happy to talk about that. Um, what we do is we will come up with a series of actions that organizations can take in order to protect themselves. So sometimes it's things like a communication response. Sometimes there are legal options that organizations can take. Sometimes there are um, proactive messaging strategies that can be put in place, but it really comes down to what's actually happening. And that's where we've developed the technology to be able to detect this in um, near real time. Um, what's the impact? So is it actually um, working or is it a situation where if a tree falls in the woods and no one hears it, does it make a sound? And then finally, what's the mitigation strategy? And a lot of that has to do with um, whatever the company's goals, risk tolerance, et cetera, is. And that's where it starts to become a really bespoke um, and SaaS enabled um, service offering. And so um, I, I do think when we, when we start talking about this and we start talking about what's the different role of different organizations, um, going back to the election example, and I'm happy to talk through um, some other examples in, in broad terms of what a for-profit company could do or a private individual, but um, I, I do want to take some time to talk about what the role should be of, for example, government institutions who are um, empowered to be able to take action to protect us from things like 
foreign influence, from things like um, nefarious actors who are using disinformation in order to do things like recruit into violent extremist organizations? And what is their responsibility to both um, balancing security, but then on the other hand, balancing accessibility and um, you know protecting freedom of speech? We are a democracy that relies upon freedom of speech in order to be able to actively participate in our government and civil discourse, et cetera. Um, and so when we think about how do we balance those different things, what have we seen that's worked? Well, it's pretty cut and dry right now, I think, for a lot of people. Um, foreign attempts to influence an election is bad. Um, that does seem to be a red line if you're able to attribute a foreign actor. But where it gets murkier is what happens when um, a foreign um, funded think tank, for example, um, like strategic research, um, hires somebody to run an op-ed in a local paper that's a US person. What happens when some of these state-run media outlets start opening LLCs in or that are domestic based? Um, is it still a foreign entity if you're not able to track the funding? And so those are the pieces where we're starting to see the disinformation landscape, particularly as it relates to elections, become much more diffuse. And those are the questions that policymakers need to um, really start thinking through as we start talking about a comprehensive regulatory framework to be able to build, um, build the necessary protections and measures so that people are still able to access accurate information. Because what we're seeing now is, um, is not working. It's, um, you know, we're, we're continuing to see um, the, these algorithmic silos that have been created continue to create their own echo chambers and people um, and bad actors being able to access those um, echo chambers with false information that then continues to get legs of its own and narratives build within their communities until they um, move into other social media platforms, until they move into different communities and start to spread. But how do we build, um, how do we build the structures and how do we build the incentives to make it so that people can still access accurate information? So I'll give you an example. One of the challenges that we had um, is right now, um, if you go and Google who stole the 2020 election and pick your state, I am going to almost guarantee you that um, CISA rumor control, that um, Secretary of State's offices are not going to be prioritized within the search algorithms. Um, that's the type of thing that we need to start thinking about, is how do we make it so that people can access accurate information from credible sources? And I'm not necessarily talking about news outlets, I'm talking about primary sources, so that they have the most up-to-date information. We know things like that are possible because um, we've seen it happen with coronavirus. We've seen it happen with natural disasters, that sort of thing. But what we need to do is we as a society need to decide what are we comfortable with and then who is responsible for implementation. Because until we have those answers, a lot of the responsibility in terms of determining fact from fiction falls on the users to be able to determine what's real and what's not real. And the question then becomes, should it be that way? Maybe, maybe that's the default. But I think what we need to start asking about and what we need to start talking about and where I think there's a real opportunity for companies to be part of the solution in terms of being able to help build those defensive measures and be able to help build those protections is um, what should it be like? Because right now there's very little regulation, which means that there's a lot of opportunity for civil society and private sector organizations to take the lead until regulation can catch up. So I'll pause there. I want to leave plenty of time for questions. That's actually perfect. Um, leading into, you know, your last, uh, I guess, uh, talking point, which was there's, because regulations are lagging, there's so much opportunity for, you know, anybody to kind of come up with solutions. And it's um, a really sort of greenfield area right now. Um, since we're talking to a lot of entrepreneurs uh, in this audience and investors, um, you know, someone asked, you know, if they're thinking about trying to build a product uh, and raise money, um, and, and I'm not sure if Alethea has taken any venture capital um, or how you got started. Maybe you could kind of talk about, um, you know, whether you bootlegged your business or, or what you found worked for you, but what would be some advice that you could give to other entrepreneurs in the space? 
Definitely. So we actually are bootstrapping and that was a very deliberate decision because um, everybody on our team has firsthand experience either working on political campaigns in the US government or in the private sector on this issue. Um, you know, we may not be able to stay that way forever. Um, building technology is expensive, but um, right now it's it was important to us to be able to bootstrap. And um, I will say it is it is a space where there's still plenty of work to go around. And so I would just start by trying to find a client. And if you, and I also would say, um, wait until you build your technology, unless you have a very specific idea and you know exactly how it's going to work because it is a dynamic threat. And so um, we, we took the approach of going from services to SaaS model. Um, and so what it is that we're do, what we did was we perfected our solutions and our techniques and our um, ability to do this work in a very manual fashion. So this time a year ago, it was all I would say done by hand. And then as we were able to get more clients to be able to um, slowly build out our business, we reinvested our profits into building up um, our own technology that makes us better, stronger, faster. And that's worked for us because we know that we can do this work. We've been able to attribute networks. We've been able to um, see a range of actions come from our work and our efforts. And that's what's been able to protect our clients. Um, and so building the tools really mindfully um, was important to us so that we're not necessarily wasting resources. You know, when the pandemic hit, we didn't have to make any cuts. We were actually able to continue growing organically because um, we weren't bloated or backed or anything like that. It was, that wasn't, um, the, the economic downturn wasn't as much of a concern for us because we were already really lean. Um, that being said, everyone is different. We wanted to prioritize being able to kind of chart our own course and build our own destiny. And I'm not going to lie and say it's easy to bootstrap a business. It's really hard. So um, I would also take that into consideration is your, your situation and what it is that um, you have the ability to, to accomplish without um, a large backing. And I'm also happy to talk to anybody offline too who's thinking about it because entrepreneurship can be a lonely road and it doesn't have to be. That's perfect. And I think a good note to end on before we move to our panel. Um, Lisa, thank you so much for talking about Alethea Group. Um, and it's great that you're open to, you know, people just kind of cold emailing you and asking you questions about, you know, uh, from the entrepreneurship side. So um, Lisa is great on Twitter. You guys should uh, follow her there. <laughs> um, and I'm sure there are other ways to reach out to her, but um, Twitter has been uh, a great follow for me. So be sure to check her out there. Um, Lisa, thank, thank you. you so much. Thanks. All right. I will uh, now move on to our last, but certainly not least, actually, actually our, our, our most exciting segment uh, of today's event. Um, and we've got a great panel for you uh, featuring some amazing heavy hitters in the digital media and leading edge technology space. Um, so I'm just going to do a really quick uh, introduction of everybody on the panel uh, and, our, and our moderator, and then I'll turn it over to uh, Tara, who will be moderating for us. So um, first up, we've got uh, Paul Chung from the Knight Foundation. Uh, Paul manages a multi-million dollar investment portfolio for the Knight Foundation. Um, his key investment areas include scaling AI, uh, business sustainability solutions, and mitigating misinformation. So Paul's background is also in journalism, um, and he's focused on digital transformation um, at many of the media outlets he's been with, NBC, uh, Associated Press, Miami Herald, and Washington, um, Wall Street Journal. Uh, another speaker we have with us today, Bilal Zuberi from Lex Capital. Um, Lex Capital, uh, I think many people who've uh, joined us today have, uh, know of them, um, but they're a, a really big venture capital firm investing in emerging sciences and technologies, um, often at the, what they like to say, the outermost edge of what's possible. They take a lot of moonshots, take a lot of risk and a lot of it uh, tends to work out. Um, so Bilal himself invests in um, startup solving big practical problems with technolo technologically ambitious solutions. Um, and he believes technology can be used to uh, address some of our biggest problems and that's mobility, uh, connectivity, food, uh, manufacturing, healthcare, and of course this information. So Paul was, uh, Bilal was one of the uh, investors in Yonder whom you guys saw present earlier uh, with us today. 
We also have uh, Dan McCoy, who's uh, an associate professor of computer science and engineering at the NYU Tandon School. Um, he's also currently working on the uh, NYU Ad Observatory, which is a group within uh, the Tandon School examining uh, sort of the political ads that people are say seeing or being fed on social networks. Um, you may have heard about them in the news recently where they received a cease and desist letter from a, a very large platform. So we've got a very interesting perspective from Dan. Um, and then lastly, our moderator, uh, Tara McGowan. So Tara, also an NYU alum, uh, is a, a democratic, um, uh, I guess, political operative, but she also uh, is a founder of many other uh, digital media uh, companies, as well as um, efforts, including Acronym, which is uh, where she's CEO right now. Um, and it's an, ag uh, it's an online advocacy group. Um, and then there's a political action committee, uh, PACRONIM, um, which is a left of center uh, uh, sort of PAC around, uh, that's aligned with Acronym, um, the Courier Newsroom, and a digital ad consultancy, the Lockwood Strategy Lab. And Tara is, um, I just wanted to highlight uh, her accomplishment with this past election. Uh, her group, Acronym, um, is actually responsible for mobilizing uh, over 3 million uh, new voters in this past election. So people who've never voted before, um, getting them out to vote, uh, informing them of different issues that are going on. So um, congratulations, Tara, um, that's fantastic effort. And with all of that, um, I'm gonna turn the panel over to you and we look forward to hearing from all of you. Thank you, Teal. And we did it without any disinformation. Uh, right. which we're going to talk about. Um, thanks so much, Teal, for having me. Um, I'm really excited to be here. It is always strange not getting to actually see the faces of the people we're talking to, um, but I trust that you're all there and super engaged. Um, and I'm really excited to be here with this panel, who um, I know of everybody on the panel, but have never met any of you before. So it is um, very lovely to meet you. And I know uh, Damon, more than others, knows a bit about me since we show up in his ad transparency tool all the time, which we're gonna talk about. Um, so thank you guys so much for coming. I wanna go ahead and dig right in. Um, obviously uh, this year has um, seen more, uh, I would say uh, disinformation reaching the national uh, media and, um, and, and, and hitting uh, the, the cultural nerve, if you will, um, more than I would say most have in this country with the election and the pandemic. Um, and so it's a little strange. I don't work on the business side of this, so I'm excited uh, to learn about it. Of course, it is um, a very bitter sweet topic that we need to have a business industry to combat disinformation at scale online. Um, but very excited to hear how you guys are all working to solve this problem. So um, I want to go ahead and start um, uh, with you, Paul. Uh, this is uh, this epidemic of disinformation is um, probably making uh, the lives of journalists harder than most people <laughs> um, in the country and in the world right now, um, needing to be able to combat disinformation and get facts. Uh, out there in front of people and in a new digital ecosystem that we live in. So I would love to hear a little bit about the efforts, the incredible efforts at Knight Foundation that you're spearheading um, and, and just hear a little bit about what the resources are that your team has found to be effective at arming journalists with the tools they need to be able to operate in this ecosystem today. Yeah, first, when we think about um, this whole issue, we sort of try to shy away from labeling whether it's misinformation or disinformation. Um, so in fact, we basically call it, this is a information disorder, right? Because whether you're doing this or misinformation, the purpose is to sort of, um, sort of like get the audience sort of disoriented from what the truth is. So when we think about our investment, we really think about, about sort of where could we move our resources in a way that we can make that impact, right? Um, so when I joined Knight, you know, I firmly believe that with Knight's resources, we are not going to be able to sort of change this. We, we're not in the game to eradicate this problem because I don't believe this problem can be eradicated, right? So early on, we do get a lot of pitches that people will say, we have this tool that will sort of, you know, uh, make this problem go away. And, and, you know, my issue with a lot of the tools is, A, who's actually going to use it? Um, and B, you know, does the consumer care? Right, like there's certain segment of consumers that we already know that they are fine with this 
problem, right? They, they are self-selected. So when we think about the problem that we want to focus on, we really think about what kind of infrastructure we need to build to help journalists build resiliency against this so that them themselves don't become a super spreader, right? So what are the framework, the processes, the technology that we need to equip journalists so that they have the proper knowledge and, and sort of equipments to slow down this problem so that they could sort of deal with it at the speed of the internet. So recently, Knight had made an announcement that we invested a little bit more than $3 million the past year on a couple of big grantees. First, we invested in first draft. And, you know, I will look at them as sort of the, um, the frontline solution where they're helping every single journalist understand how this problem takes shape and how do you identify it and what is it that you can do about it, right? And then, you know, and, and, and to my knowledge, they have a lot of great success, right? So now they have trained more than 3,000 journalists across the U.S. A lot of newsroom are implementing their training as part of the core curriculum, but that's not enough, right? Just like many newsrooms have standards and practices, how do we ensure that, you know, the learning that the individual journalists acquiring get reinforced in a system level. So we recently made a grant to the Short Scene Center with um, Dr. Joan Donovan, where the purpose of that grant is really to work with newsroom leaders to design a system that we could sort of mitigate this within the news ecosystem, right? So what are the standards and ethical practices and what are the stop gaps that we need to come in place so that, so that you know, um, we don't get duped, right? The news industry doesn't get duped into this. Um, so that's sort of the, you know, for the bottom up and top approach. In terms of the tools, we sort of starting to think about, again, what are the, the things that we could give journalists a degree of confidence saying that this piece of media has been manipulated. So we recently funded the Rochester of Institute of um, Technology to look into deep fate. Now there, their technology is designed with journalists in mind. And, and, and what's different about their two compared to a lot of the other two is they're not here to say that this is, you know, a fake or not a fake, right? They're not here to eradicate the problem. They're giving journalists a certain degree of confidence that this piece of media asset has been manipulated. And then what the journalists will do is then they have to verify sort of, is this a fake or is this a, a, a shadow fake? Or is this sort of, temper in that Nancy Pelosi slowing down video kind of way, right? And then, um, so again, it's just really what are the infrastructure that we have in place? And, and we don't see our investment just end here. Um, something that I'm looking sort of into the next year is how do we equip sort of um, non-English speaking journalism outfit to have the same capacity, right? Because as we know this year, much of this problem is seeped into communities of colors, especially with COVID, right? With the vaccine issue when, you know, and so we feel that there's some infrastructure now being built for the mainstream media. So how do we sort of be able to um, spread that knowledge base to um, more ethnic media as well? That's great. And I actually, I read an article this morning and I think it was foreign policy on efforts in Taiwan that have been really effective at combating and countering disinformation, taking it offline beyond journalists too, and just sort of building more media literacy and civic engagement in communities, which is so important. I also want to plug Dr. Uh, Donovan's uh, meme newsletter out of Shore and Screen is wonderful. If folks listening don't read it, I really um, enjoy it. It will terrify you, uh, but it's really interesting. So um, thank you for that, Paul. And um, you mentioned also the speed at which disinformation, misinformation, or uh, uh, information generally sp spreads, especially online and social media platforms. Bilal, I would love to hear from you about um, what you see as sort of the biggest challenge in identifying misinformation online and in the life cycle. When is it too late to be able to stop misinformation from having uh, the grave impact it can have if, if you're able to stop it at that point at all? So, you know, I, I think I agree with Paul when he was saying that this is not a problem that you're gonna stop. So this is a problem we have to figure out how to deal with. We are living in a very distributed society powered by the internet. Um, it has had a lot of implications. One of those implications has been that the centrality of services that used to allow overhead services, editorial functions, fact-checking functions, they've gone away. You know, venture capital has now funded 
things like Substack and others where, you know, individual journalists are being, you know, hey, why do you need to work for New York Times? Go start your own newsletter and sell it. Um, business models are evolving. You know, we've gone from an ad-based system or that's what happened to the newspapers and that didn't quite work out very well. Uh, you know, taking, you know, offline ads, which have helped, you know, information get paid to have veracity of information or true information uh, has gone out of the window. Um, so with, with new uh, business models in place, um, sometimes you have to really question first, whose job is it to actually identify that there's misinformation or disinformation and then figure out, you know, how to stop, put a stop to it. Um, the, 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 there's a few different ways in which to think about this, right? Like, so one is you heard from Yonder earlier, which is one of our portfolio companies. And they basically say, it doesn't really matter to really try to understand the, authentic, the, the veracity of the information, if it's real or not. I mean, you may have an opinion, you may have an emotion that you're feeling that may or may not be real, but that's an emotion. You're feeling it, so it's real enough, right? You're pissed off at some politician or you're pissed off at some brand for whatever reason. You, you're, you're, your Coca-Cola doesn't taste right and you're upset at it, right? Uh, and you have, to, you have a right to display your emotions and you have a right to convince people, shout from the rooftops. And now we have platforms available for you to do that. Is that really true? Has that really changed? I don't know. How do you find you know, the real information there? But that emotion matters. What Yonder does is says, you know, if you're going to have information, whether it's misinformation or information, you need to understand um, the, uh, the, the authenticity of that. Meaning, is this being pumped from somebody else or is it actually real? Meaning, are your consumers or our, our, you know, just audience generally uh, genuinely affected by this? And if yes, do something about it. Engage in a conversation. Now, how you engage in a conversation, there's another chapter, which is, you know, you, you know, do you use influencers to engage in the conversations? How does a brand or a business have authentic conversations? I mean, we have a problem that media properties like Facebook and Twitter, they don't really talk to you, right? Like there's no conversation, you know, I'm, funny we're having this conversation when the CEOs of Twitter and Facebook are in front of a Senate Judiciary Committee. Um, there is no time that Facebook or Twitter or Google actually speak to you as a consumer, but they are now having to do that. When Twitter puts on those little logos that this, this is not real news or whatever, they're now having to talk to you. So we're emerging out of this place where these were platforms that were anonymous we only knew about their founders because they were billionaires. That's the only reason we knew them. We didn't know anything else about them or their philosophies or vision or anything. Um, but now we're having to understand that. So first important thing that's happening is that, you know, do you care to know if the information is real or if it's misinformation? The second thing is to understand, and I, I speak that as, an, uh, as, as a VC, is um, this is also a media service, right? You can actually take deep fakes and create art you can actually, you know, you, this is also freedom of information, but also creativity. Um, so how do you then create tools that allow people to express themselves in ways that one could argue it's fake? I mean, movies are fake, right? I mean, movies are not real. Uh, books are fiction uh, and they influence us. So how do you then enable that and then also educate society in understanding that movies are not real, TV is not real. I had to do that with my kid. Hey, this thing that scares you, that video you watch, it's not real. Don't worry about it. Don't get nightmares at night, right? So that's the other thing. And then the third thing is, um, you know, machine learning AI, broadly speaking, is entering all our life everywhere. Uh, it's being used in every kind of information you and I, you know, um, you know, digest. Right now I'm using Zoom. There's actually, I just noticed that there's some filter on that I'm actually appearing brighter and whiter than I actually am. Um, you know, and, and so the, the question that emerges is, how do you then find signals that tell you that this information is relevant or useful and also it's not biased? So there's emerging fields of technology that are coming out. Explainable AI is an example of a technology space which is understanding the, you know, the biases built into AI models, uh, you know, providing you with transparency. A lot of these times, it's not because somebody is inherently building bias into the models, but it just happens to be that that's the data that's being fed into the models and these models are either drifting or whatever is happening that's affecting you. So I guess the, you know, I'll, I'll start by basically saying that in the world of business, people have understood this is a real problem. It's a problem, societal problem, but also business problem. 
tools are emerging now to start to understand this on how to communicate and how do you understand the workflows and how do you understand the outcomes. And then people are starting to figure out how to monetize that, which will lead to eventually, I think, society actually engaging with it. That's great. And I do have one follow-up question for you, Bilal, on that. Who are the, uh, who are the end users? Who are the clients for these products at this stage in, in the life cycle you just mentioned? I, many different entities. So uh, oddly enough, you know, you'd be, you know, it's probably not news media, even though that's probably, you know, they don't have money. I mean, let's put it that way, right? So the problem you really run into is always- Because goes of back. the tech platforms that, no, I'm just kidding. Keep going. No, all, all, of, all of that included. I mean, even, even big tech news media doesn't have money to pay for these things, right? But it affects a lot of other people. Banks are affected. You know, if by, you know, there's regulatory, there are a lot of industries which are regulated. You know, news was never really regulated. Right? I'm not suggesting you should be regulated. I'm just saying banks are regulated. So if there's a bias based on gender or race or whatever, you have to identify that because if somebody else identifies you, you can be sued. And hence, immediately risk management systems come into place, budgets become available, you go to chief information security officers, you go to CIOs and they pay for this. Um, the second thing that's emerging, which is actually really something to watch is consumers. Right? We have gotten used to over the last 20 years of internet as like having things for free. But that is changing pretty rapidly, right? People are now paying for, I mean, people are paying for email services, which is like as free as it goes, right? But people are starting to pay for newspaper subscriptions and people are starting to pay for um, memberships into groups. Uh, you know, we have uh, a, another company we funded, Primer, which is an AI-based um, uh, information news site in some ways, right? Used by analysts in intelligence agencies, but also for uh, analysts in companies and others. That's what people are subscribing to. So we will have to develop business models because if you don't develop business models, there's no free lunch. Like somebody somewhere, whether it's a shadow army of fake news propagandists sitting in Saudi Arabia or, or Eastern Europe somewhere or whatever, you will be fed that information because they're making their money elsewhere. And we just saw an Excel spreadsheet. There's a lot of money that they're making compared to you know any news journalist would love to have a $2 million net revenue business, but they don't. No, that's right. And uh, it's money and it's, or it's power, or it's power for money. But um, I would love to talk about uh, Facebook, the platform in particular, uh, that is under a lot of public scrutiny and heat for being a space where misinformation and disinformation spreads quite rapidly. And Mark Zuckerberg, the CEO, has been very, very outspoken and defensive about um, uh, their, you know, their platform as being a, a place for free speech. And so that dictates what policies they will put in place and what they won't. I have my own feelings about those subjective decisions, but I would love, Damon, to turn to you to talk about this a little bit. Um, there has been a lot of press and attention uh, focused on the past year in particular on uh, political advertising um, as a culprit for misinformation spreading online. Uh, that has resulted in a number of these social media platforms coming up with bans um, on political and advocacy advertising. Facebook has had a ban in place um, for uh, a few weeks now, since a week before the election, uh, that they rolled out um, uh, saying that that would help curb misinformation online. Uh, that said, um, as of uh, just recently, Morning Consult had a poll that seven out of 10 Republicans in this country um, do not believe that the election was free or fair um, uh, because of disinformation that has been spread by the president himself and the Republican Party and online. And that is just a fact. That is not something I am saying because I am a Democratic strategist. But um, I am curious, uh, since you spend a lot of time in the political ad transparency tool on Facebook, um, uh, your, your, what you've sort of seen and experienced, and do you think that paid advertising is the culprit or one of many? And do you think that bans like this actually help uh, curb disinformation on these platforms? Sure. Um, thank you. So, right. So to start off, I feel like disinformation is, it's kind of like pollution, right? It has this negative externalities to it where the platforms kind of perversely profit from disinformation oftentimes. And so um, that was kind of the genesis for why I felt like, you know, independent research was needed on this because I felt like you know, because of that perverse incentives, the platforms were just not incentivized correctly until regulation catches up to actually deal with this problem correctly with an ear. And so, right, they were hauled into Senate and they made promises to make data transparent. Um, you know, Facebook, 
you know, tried to do this, but in a way where they still controlled the data and it wasn't truly transparent within there. And so this is where my research group kind of stepped in and right, our goal is to make this data truly transparent within your, and so we're a nonprofit. And so we want to try and service those people that can't afford you know, this data to do this analysis of this data or the tools needed to combat misinformation within here. So this is really our goal within here is right, not to cut, you know, special deal with Facebook, not to accept funding from Facebook that would, you know, necessitate us limiting you know, the data that we collect or who has access to the data and things like that. And so we've um, depended largely on foundations to fund our research within here. And we don't charge anyone anything for access to our data or tools or you know, whatever data analysis we can muster to support their analysis within there. And so, um, right, we started with the data that, you know, Facebook was making available and then making it more available through there. And so we, um, we basically had to hire a full-time engineer in order to extract this data out of, you know, Facebook's cold dead hands within there. And then, you know, through a series of, you know, skirmishes in the media and then that make Facebook agree that we could redistribute the data, you know, more freely within there. And so we do that so that now the data is in the hands of academics, journalists, civil society groups that need it. All right, but data, raw data is oftentimes not that useful to a lot of people because, right, it requires a lot of analysis for that data. And so we've been trying to build up tools to try and help this. And so one of the tools that we built, I'll just share my screen here, is what we call Ad Observatory within here. So this is a tool that's just simply trying to track online political advertising. So right, we have the little widgets <laughs> acronym <laughs> is there the big spender. Um, and right, we're just simply trying to, you know, basically help journalists, especially local journalists that can't afford, you know, data journalists and things like that to be able to report on these elections. And so through the website, Right, you can kind of hone in on look at you know key races and things like that within here and so this is supported i've lost track at this point how many local journalists have used this website to write stories it's in you know the 30s or 40s at least at this point and so i think that this was very valuable um the other thing that we do is right the data that facebook is providing is naturally limited and incomplete within here and so this is where we went out and right we collected data we basically recruited volunteers to collect data you know, that they were being provided by the platform. So to collect ads that they were being provided with and targeting information, which Facebook refuses to make transparent within here. Um, and so, right, we found where the gaps were in Facebook's transparency within here. And so this is, this is the tool that people can download and install on here. Um, it does not per collect any personal information. All that it collects are the ads that you're being served and the targeting information that Facebook is providing to you for that ad within your um, Facebook and most recently Mark Zuckerberg in the testimony today claimed that we are scraping Facebook's website and so they served a cease and desist to us to stop this and right, my lawyers won't let me say much about this but I, I believe you know that right there's a lot of people that are collecting a lot more data than us and so the reason that we were targeted is because right we are you know, on this mission to actually provide ad transparency outside of the scope of what Facebook is willing to provide within here. And this is something that naturally makes Facebook nervous within here. Um, the other tools that we build, sorry, I'll, I'll wrap up in a second, are an ad screen tool. So we partner with civil society groups to help us kind of find this information because right, we're computer scientists, we can't find it within there. And so we're using kind of their expertise to label data and then using machine learning to help them even more efficiently find it within there. So that's another tool that we provide to um, Change of Color, um, National Leadership Council, Avaz, lots of nonprofit groups that are looking at disinformation, Muslim advocates within there. And so we're hoping to expand the number of partners within there. And then we're also hoping to expand you know, our data collection and analysis to YouTube, because that's another big source that needs to be analyzed and made more transparent and where Google also hasn't been falling through on their you know, promises to make political advertising more transparent. 
That's great. And so much of this is, is about transparency and, and being able to understand um, what information is being spread online. And, and it comes down to the point you made, Damon, which I think is a really important one. I'd love to pose sort of a broad question to the group on this, which is that um, uh, we don't have regulation for these platforms. So obviously misinformation, disinformation are not limited to spreading on social media platforms, but we are in our uncharted territory and we do not have federal regulation on these platforms. And so they are left to self-regulate and it is never a good thing when corporations are self-regulating, uh, no matter what industry they're in. So I'm, I'm curious for, for this group's um, just sort of uh, thoughts on that in terms of how, um, you know, how the landscape and how regulation moving forward, hopefully we get some um, under Biden administration, but that will depend uh, quite a bit on the Senate makeup. You know, how will that shift um, the work that you all do, uh, Bilal and Paul in particular, in terms of addressing this? Obviously it won't eliminate misinformation, but if it does curb it, how does that impact um, uh, the landscape that you guys see for your respective uh, industries? Yeah, I think, again, for me, whether there's sort of regulation in place or not, this problem is not going away anytime soon. And I think, you know, part of this is we have to look at, we have to manage this issue almost like a chronic illness, right? You know, I think sort of, you know, how does the public understand this, the impact of this problem to them? with or without regulation? And then who are the constituents? Who are the people who could actually do something about it, right? So there are, you know, and, and I'm just sort of focusing on just one sector, which is journalists, right? And then, but there's all these other constituents, right? There's the technology platforms, there's the regulators, and, and then there's also sort of like the regular community leaders, right? And so I think this is sort of, this is not a problem that's unique to journalism. I would say is pretty systemic technology enable the speed and the reach to go beyond the traditional means. So I think this, you know, in order to fix this, I don't think any regulation will suddenly be able to nip it. It will sort of maybe make the technology platform respond to it quicker or do something more drastic. But when you think about how the problem is taking shape, it's taking shape in your private messaging from WhatsApp to, to messaging to, you know, to the, you know, front facing platform. So I, I think it's pretty like deep in our system. So I think part of this is what is the infrastructure that we set in place to deal with this issue. And I think, again, when I look at our work, this is only the beginning of, of the work. So I just, I just add to that, that, you know, regulation is not necessarily a bad thing. You know, regulation in other industries has been often clarifying, if nothing else. Uh, it, it allows people to know what is important and what is less important. And, you know, many other industries could take regulation and probably do better. Um, the, and, and hence, I'm not against regulation and it has to be figured out the right way. I think the important thing is that regulation does not get put on any platform or whatever as like a punishment. Because there's, there's also this other problem in society right now, which is, you know, well, you know, the left believe that they're being censored and the right believe they're being censored. And, you know, it's like this whack-a-mole going on right now. Um, you know, I mean, look, the reality is that there is court cases going on right now about the elections. I don't know if I should be reading more about it or less about it. I know where I, my opinion stands, but I could argue that if I was not in, you know, in one direction or the other, it would be a real questionable thing about you know, how it's being portrayed in the media right now. And I could understand people's emotions about it. Goes back to what regulation, you know, thinking from an industrial industry perspective, um, it is really important that people, are, uh, people realize that we're in a new era right now. The technologies that are being deployed both on the offensive front for disinformation and misinformation campaigns are evolving extremely rapidly. The platforms will need to understand that they have to, they, it is their responsibility to deal with that. It is their responsibility to develop new tools to deal with that. And it's their responsibility to actually disseminate information to educate society. At the end of the day, it will all come down to society understanding that all information you find on the internet is not true. And, you know, tools like what Damon was just now talking about, the transparency into information is going to be extremely important in doing that. We're not going to change that. Campaign ads have always been full of bullshit, right? And, but it was always okay because it was, you know, yeah, you saw some stupid thing on TV and you were like, didn't think about it. But now when it's in our face and it's reaching people 
who were otherwise not reached. And it's influencing people who don't have enough information. So they only get one point of view and that they take as the sole truth. I think this is now we're starting to actually open up a much bigger problem. It's an interesting problem. You know, it's a, it's a problem that's, you know, as I think Paul was also saying that this is not just about technologies in every facet of life. People believe in all kinds of weird shit. People believe in weird religions and cults, right? And, and you, we call that, you know, freedom of speech. You can do that. Um, we have to figure out how do we educate our community that this is now different. A random ant in some other part of the world telling you something does not make that truth fact. And you're not going to get every piece of information to them and every piece of analysis to them. They just have to be smarter in making the determination. This is not going away. In fact, I could argue it's going to get much, much worse because at least now we can put three CEOs in front of the Congress and be like, hey, what are you going to do about it? Tomorrow, it's going to be 500 companies doing this and they're going to be on blockchain and sitting in different parts of the world. They're not going to be US citizens. What are you going to do? Stop the internet? Stop flow of information? So this, is, this problem is just starting. And I think we have to think broader than regulation on big tech or five companies or 10 companies that might be affected today. I think that's right. Um, and the rule number one of misinformation or disinformation is never to amplify it. So I will say that the president has lost over a dozen court cases because there was no election fraud. Um, but um, I appreciated the point. Um, Bilal, well, thank you guys so much. I think we are close to time. Um, Teal, I, don't, I, I, I feel terrible that we went over. Do we have time for questions from the audience? Or I think, yeah, I think we're starting to, to wrap up and I know people probably have, um, you know, things to do on the calendar as well and you guys as well. I don't want to keep you, um, but this was a really great conversation. Um, terribly interesting. I, I think a lot of great points were made um, and I'm, I'm glad that the audience uh, got to know all of you a little bit better. Um, you know, all of your, uh, your profiles, your um, Twitter handles uh, are available online. I highly recommend um, everybody, you know, follow Damon, Bilal, Paul, and Tara, um, who are leaders sort of in the dis disinformation space. Um, and you can see sort of in real time, um, you know, how things evolve, especially uh, given that it's the front of everybody's mind right now. So um, yeah, with that, I guess I'll, I'll close. Um, thank you so much. Tara, uh, Paul, Bilal, and Damon for joining us. Um, and we hope to, uh, again, follow you uh, uh, in the future. And uh, everyone who's um, attended will receive a recording of this online event. Uh, so in case you have any questions, feel free to follow up with, with us then or follow up with the speakers directly. Thank you guys so much.